this is a moment to get some uh, ammunition for the the next step, the forum, and. Um, uh, and so, th what I would like to do is then asking you what would be what would be in your mind, what in your thinking, interesting building blocks for the science complexity science program dedicated to the governance of Singapore. Maybe I, I'm saying so, a few things. What I picked up these two days, one uh, something about uh, complexity science. First. There is an enormous lot of big, complex problems. The back, black swans and whatever you may call them. In Europe, we call them the grand challenges. Someone has said, you should not talk to negative. You should give it. <laughs> well, we call them grand challenges. I think I, I'm not quite sure whether things are going better by that. But nevertheless. <laughs> then one, what I picked up is, uh, if you're going to do complexity science, forget the idea of analytic, uh, an, an, an analytic scientific approach. Take the stance of the decision maker. That's a very a radical issue. And uh, Douglas did not come up with uh, quite a, a lot of critical questions. So easy it is not doing that. And, uh, but I picked up, if you're going to do it, complexity and you want to be in the service of governance, then take the stance of the decision maker. Of course, always accepting and realizing that the decision maker is not God, but just taking the stance of the decision maker. That doesn't mean that you are not complying with the decision maker. My institute is doing the same. So my, my uh, most of my enemies are the decision makers, so to say. They don't like what I'm doing. But they cannot do without me. You know, that's kind of... Uh, uh, but that's the reason is that I'm have, uh, my institute has not a problem with uh, finding my results, uh, bringing my results to parliament or politicians. And the only reason is because I take the stance of a politician and a decision maker. That's the only reason that they want to listen to me. And uh, it takes responsibility. That's what I feel and they know. So that's one. That's what I picked up and I said, this is really interesting. And uh, another one is, what the hell is the, the methodology of the uh, complexity scientific approach? What is your toolbox? And that's for me a big question. And uh, I saw, uh, uh, the, it came up uh, ideas about uh, modeling, big data, algorithms, uh, uh, agent-based modeling, you know, this kind of things. So this, this is a methodology which is not at all specific for complexity science. And the way we are doing it, we are talking about it, we are talking about complexity science which takes a stance in the frames of the three frames which we defined early in the morning. And it said, this is a new one. Well, quite a lot of universities and quite a lot of scientists are using this modeling. It's, all, it's a booming business. So what makes the difference here? That's the question which we should put on the table, I think. Then there is another thing which come up several times. Complexity science has also to do quite a lot with designing not end stage issues, that's not, in the, if you are going really and going in complexity science, forget the idea of end stages which you want to achieve. It is uh, finding uh, the, the, the tipping points and make change. Be there and make change. Do not think in terms of end stages. And that, that's a, a kind of a message which I always uh, also found back in the, uh, in the presentations on, of, of say, the architects, the designers. Um, that's an important thing, I would say. The role of designing in complexity research. One of the most important things is what I heard here is uh, when we are talking about complexity science, then we are talking about interdisciplinarity, co-creation, co-production. And not only uh, interdisciplinarity as a relationship between disciplines, but it's also with the 
outer world with the stakeholders, uh, the decision makers, citizens, the wisdom of the crowds. This is what we found here, a beautiful examples of the wisdom of the crowd. This is what we found in this presentation. The last one of Julia Watson, it was about the wisdom of the crowd. And, and scientists are coming in and they're flabbergasted by the wisdom of the crowd and the risks they are taking. These were the questions here. So when this is the case, when complexity science is about this, interdisciplinarity, wisdom of the crowd, whatever, then my question would be, what does it, the hell does it do in universities? And uh, you know, it's the last place to be for this kind of research. And uh, another one is, uh, you know, that when I'm taking the, the stance of a decision maker and going in and trying to be connected with that world, then this kind of research is also getting something activistic. It's research in action. It is always connected, and it is, it's a dangerous kind of research. It's tricky. And it's not, the, and this is so fine in analytic research, you can sleep well. But this is not the kind of research you can sleep well with. And uh, so that's what I picked up, and I said, oh my hell, this is, I, I would like to work in such a kind of an institute. If my institute is doing a little bit like this, but this, I would, oh, this is, that's nice. This is nice. And uh, so that's what I picked up. And now uh, the question is then, um, so, uh, this, so what I said be now till now is, how do we position this kind of complexity research? Where it, to what does it belong? And what does it consist of? And this is a very important thing to start with. Without that, you cannot even fill in the, the, uh, the, the, uh, the, the subjects <laughs> you want to do. So that's for me, so th l let me try to frame it that way. And now my question to you is, considering this is as, as a kind of a frame, what kind of subjects, what kind of modeling, bo uh, building blocks we should take in consideration as uh, here in the Singapore situation? Listening to Peter Ho and the ambassador with their big stories and the big problems, the grand challenges they're, f uh, f they're faced with, what are the building blocks? What should Jan Walter write down and Stephen uh, sh should write down and say, yes, when we are starting, okay, we are starting in the university, the Technical University of Singapore. It's a good one. We can do it because they're, they're, uh, at, uh, 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 you can do a lot there. So we are starting here. But what are the big issues with, uh, with the building blocks we are starting with? Could you come up with some ideas on that, please? The mic, it's always the mic syndrome, man. Thank you so much. Um, so I, I'd like to make a couple of remarks and suggestions um, just to keep the discussion. Uh, so the first thing that we have to realize uh, is that, re and this is going to be a, a very sobering thought, the first thing that we have to realize is there is no theory of complexity. It doesn't exist. So the question, next question is then, do we need it? I have no answer to that. But what we do need is to think about a theory of complexity, because otherwise it will just be a, you know, a bunch of words that um, everybody can use in all kinds of different uh, moments and, and doesn't really mean anything. What so do you compare it with? A uh, let, me let me just complexity. try to make my points. Yeah. And then, and so, so, so there is no theory of complexity. But, th but there is another thing. There is, a like you mentioned, there is a methodology of, of, of complexity. There is actually this whole toolbox, I think you were showing that, the toolbox of, 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 um, of, of method methods. Um, but if you don't have a concept of what you're going to do with your tools, uh, you might end up with a building that's actually not doing what you want it to do. So, so we need this theory of complexity. And, and I think answering one of your remarks would be that that theory probably has to come partly also from the academia. So that's where the universities come in. Um, so that was no, actually okay. defending my opposition here. So, <laughs> um, but this okay, is the thing we have to, but we have to really, so I want to repeat this. There is no theory of complexity. We actually, it's not there, but we need it in order to understand how we're going to apply methods. Otherwise we're like, you know, blind watchmaker. So, um, but there is another thing and it's really important. And I think that's what's happening here in Singapore. 
um, that is that what we realize is that the methods for complexity um, require participatory components. And that sets it really apart from anything else. It, 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 you, know, you can call it holistic, you can call it system thinking, don't care, but bo the bottom line is it's a, it is a participatory system. Um, and, and slowly, like, like uh, Rob was saying, that there, that we have you know, new methods coming up that actually allow us to encapture um, these this kind of participatory aspects. And the unique thing that I'm observing, you know, looking at, at initiatives like this all over the world, is that in Singapore, there is actually a debate between uh, the government and, and this kind of sciences. That's, that's not happening in many, uh, it's, it's, it's rarely happening in, in other places of the world. So I think Singapore really has a, has, a, has, a, has a big step here. So um, it, the question is more, how can we keep that edge here in Singapore rather than how we can start it? Because it's already, it's already happening. So what we need to think of, and that's actually what I'd, I'd like to bring to the table, is we need to think of, um, uh, a, let's call it a theory, a theory of, of, of a participatory uh, set of methods um, that we can, uh, with which we can really quantify and reason what we're doing. Otherwise, we will be, like, like I said, blind watchmakers. Okay. Okay. Other remarks? Yeah, please. Sandra van der Leeuw. I have been puzzled <laughs> by this use of this term decision maker. I once building had a blocks, building blocks, I'm asking for. I will get there, okay? Okay. Um, I have at one point in a project where I was supposed to create a complex systems model, looked for the decision maker I was going to do this for. I looked for a half a year and I never found one. I would propose as a building block to actually take the decision making here in itself as a complex system and try and understand that and improve that understanding. I realize that that is a politically difficult issue, but I do believe it is fundamental if you want to go ahead here. Political decision making as a part of a complexity system and take it in consideration whatever you do. That's it. Yeah, please. Well, good morning. I'm aware that I'm talking to um, social scientists here, physical scientists, as well as policy makers, but we all share a common humanity and uh, that's why, that's what's brought us here together addre to address this question in Singapore. Um, a building block that I would like to propose that would add to the theories that I'm sure uh, our workshop will eventually lead to complexity theories uh, is the building, the collection of data. I would like to propose that uh, perhaps we can uh, set out a framework and set out in motion and set out resources to start collecting data on the socio-ecology in Singapore and feed this into whatever future models that will come up to calibrate it. And personally, um, as I've shared quite a few times, uh, I do see a tragedy happening in Singapore. Uh, and I would subtitle it the tragedy of an overcooked steak or an overcut diamond or an overpainted Monet. But because we are in a wicked, we are in a life situation. It is a wicked problem. I would, from an optimist point, we call it a unfolding adventure. Yeah, as opposed to a wicked problem. Um, in a, in in a hundred years' time, would Singapore be the the I call it the jewel that it is today? I, even though an optimist, I actually have my serious doubts. And um, I would like to just uh, suggest that we can collect the data now and track where we're going. You know, all phyla, that means from microbes to trees to people around uh, very stable uh, e ecosystems like forests, you know, which I, uh, I live next to. Uh, and then use the data to, pre to help educate or shape future island city-states. Okay. That will pop up, you yeah. know, around the world, like Singapore, so yeah. that they can avert our overcooking, our overcooked steak. We had one theory of complexity and in, uh, with specific attention to participatory methods and so on and so on. We had one on um, what was yours? 
decision making as a complex system in itself as it works out here and that relates mainly to the ambassadors talking yeah I, 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 you're right and then we have here the data the, the data collection we, the data when we have consider singapore as an eco ecological system or a, then you need data in, in whatever you do you need data that's what and you're you're very pessimistic but that's the nature of city, uh, singaporean citizens uh, I'm no. Says. no. Oh. But okay. uh, I'm being realistic. Okay, okay. Please. Um, what another element that I was adding to that talk is, again, bringing together academics and scientists and the actual community. And in what space can you actually bring them in? So could you create, oh, sorry. Uh, could you create a kind of lab within that space that will allow you to bring practitioners from various places around Singapore, whether it's government or communities, and you know these kind of projects can be designed in different ways for experiential learning and helping them to develop their own tools and frameworks in what would work for them to deal with complex environments. Create labs. That's what you were saying. Yes, but experiential labs. So yeah, the idea is yeah. to bring people from the outside to actually participate in the development process, yeah. not scientists developing yeah. tools for yeah. practitioners. Okay. Yeah. Please. So l let me just say that the, uh, li living in Washington for 20 years uh, and dealing with policymakers on a regular basis, uh, Washington is its own kind of city-state in the sense that it, uh, the, you know, it puts policy in that not just for the city of Washington, but policy for a broader world. And it, it is my experience that there are people in government who are early adopters of new ideas, new methodologies, new, new thinking. And uh, there are other people in government who are very recalcitrant and are gonna be very conservative and not wanna do anything different than they've always done in the past. So it is the case that uh, if in fact you can find a killer app uh, for of a complexity, say rendered idea or methodology or something, uh, which a, p a specific policymaker can use and wants, then a kind of like, you know, uh, all bets are off, hold on to your hat. I mean, they're, they're going to run with it and do something spectacular. And they, uh, let me give you a very concrete example. So uh, in the wake of 9-11, what actually happened in the U.S. government was uh, the question arose as to what should, what should the U.S. government do? How should the U.S. government prepare for, say, you know, weapons-grade smallpox being put in the New York subway or the Washington subway? And the answer, given by traditional models, by uh, mathematical models, differential equation models, of the kind Peter knows well, SIR, SIS type models, was you basically have to, if, if in fact that event happened, just to basically, basically vaccinate the, an entire city. I mean, vaccinate an entire city means you have to have you know, 10 million, 20 million, 30 million vaccines available. One in 10,000 people uh, get a, a disfiguring side effect from that vaccine. You may have all kinds of contingency plans for those people. To make a long story short, the White House basically said in, in, in October of 9-11, or October of 11, or October of 2001, they said, we need to have a better method to figure out who gets the vaccine. Now, field epidemiologists who are, uh, I would maybe call them uh, kind of uh, complexity scientists who, uh, who, who speak complexity science, science without, without knowing that they're complexity scientists because they actually deal with stuff on the ground and complex things on the ground. Those field epi epi epidemiologists said, well, if we know how to deal with it, we have to do trace vaccination. And as you don't vaccinate the entire city of New York, you vaccinate only the people who are in the subway and the people who were next to the people in the subway and people who are family members, et cetera, et cetera. This trace vaccination, now that involves maybe 5% or 10% as much vaccination as the whole city. The trouble is there's no model for that. There's no way to model that. And so the s people at the CDC said, well, we can try to build, and they, they didn't even have the terminology. So we can try to build a large scale stochastic network simulation. But we said, you mean, you mean an age-based model, right? Uh, and so, uh, at that point, uh, you know, the White House, to their credit, said, uh, NIH, take 50 million bucks and figure out the right tools for doing this. And so back to Peter's point, there's no general theory of complex systems, because complex systems are everything, so you, ca you can't have a theory of everything. But, but in particular domains, like, uh, like this uh, trace vaccination uh, uh, s uh, paradigm, you can build up s computational tools, specialized tools, and then you can now you have the rever reverse case. Everything we've been talking about for the last couple of days, it seems to me, is, uh, is, is uh, how to get policymakers to buy into, to be consumers of, to demand your product, demand your, your, your result. Okay. And now this, I'm saying there is, there's, if you can get the reverse to happen, then all bets are off. If you can get the policymaker to say, you, know, you re the researcher, give me tools to help me make a decision, 
at that point, then uh, it's a different world. Okay. <laughs> okay. Yeah, please. So the ambassador's question to us this morning uh, was, how does the government des uh, respond to a desire to participate? Um, and I wanted to uh, propose that uh, we've heard some things which contribute to an answer here. Uh, Peter Brathen yesterday um, put out the paradox of control. The more control you retain, the less you actually have. And Sander van der Leeuw uh, emphasized the importance of information flows. And I think these things uh, come together. Uh, and understood within the proposals for experiential learning and participatory processes, these push towards uh, something which is essentially a functioning public sphere in which bottom-up voices are allowed to be heard. And it's anything but a killer app for proposing or finding solutions, but it's kind of an alternative pathway which essentially has to exist for that possibility to be there for Subox to be uh, um, created. Okay. Please. Um, so I want to build on, on, Robert, on Robert's point is that you know, we're, we're exploring the, the cutting edge of, of, you know, complexity and governance and policy, et cetera. And, you know, that's certainly well beyond s science at this point. It's important to do, but if you're going to be successful and create a culture of complexity, um, you really need to, to get those bases in where you can have success. So, indeed, and there are lots of areas that actually really solve problems, so epidemiology, traffic, logistics, um, military. So, you know, it, at least make sure that there are a bunch of those, those research projects that are there that deliver, deliver real <coughs> goods. And that then can, t can be a platform for having these more esoteric discussions and more exploratory things. But if you don't have the fa those, those foundational bits that deliver the goods, you, you just, you, you don't have the credibility. It'll seem like a sort of an interesting uh, yeah. philosophical yeah. bit of So you're saying uh, when you're starting here, take, uh, when, you, when you're going to start with doing complexity research, do it on subjects where they in fact are waiting for you and you can contribute to their solving their problems. I'm saying do both because it yeah, gives yeah, you the I know, I know. To think but it was sense. the building block. Uh, uh, you said you've got to be precise on the selection of your themes, and you've got to have success here, and you have got to create your d your own demands. That's what you both of you are saying. This is very important when you're not doing that and you're going in abstracts and so on on the theory of complexity. How how necessary it is, but when you are not doing this, then you'll die in beauty or something like that. I think what you were saying is that, that you have to um, make use of the success stories that are already there and, and build from that. So is it correct? Yeah, it's to get a, literally a license to think. You yeah. need to, in, in our society, and for very good reason, you need to deliver real value in order to, to have the, <laughs> the have license credit. to do more esoteric things. Yeah. And, and the good thing is that there, there's enough uh, you know, examples and cases around the world, and the epidemiology is clearly one, but, right. but you know, traffic and logistics, yeah. uh, genetic algorithms yeah. for, you yeah. know, th there's some stuff that's incredibly exciting and delivers real economic value and practice to policymakers, but, and you need those foundations in order to be able to okay. do them more. Okay. Sir. I'm glad the subject of traffic has been brought up. Okay, now you're home. So uh, let's talk about something a little bit more concrete. Singapore is one of the earliest uh, cities to start area, what we call the area licensing scheme, which stops traffic from going to the center area and asks for the payment of a toll or a fee to go in. And this has evolved over the years together with uh, car ownership constraints. Uh, and we've had uh, extreme examples uh, of uh, oscillations between trying to control very strictly the car owning population uh, so much so that today the policy is that uh, the car o population is only allowed to increase 0.5% a year and when you have a population increase of 2% a year you can see that it's regressing in terms of the car ownership ratio 
and then coupled with the influx of uh, well-off foreigners, I mean, we have quite a lot of millionaires in Singapore, uh, this creates a rich, poor divide, which causes a lot of social unhappiness. And on the other hand... What is your building block then? You the want building to block is the transportation system. How to Start with that, you're saying. Yes. Because it's... it's as, as a building block. Yeah, to, to demonstrate some uh, results. But isn't it a holy cow? It is not a holy cow. Okay. Uh, it is something, in fact, uh, that touches uh, everybody's lives. Okay. And I don't think there's a dogmatic uh, view in the government in terms of which way to do it. It's just that they haven't found the balance okay. and don't know how to do it. Okay. And I think this is an open problem that complexity could play a role. Thank you. Brief reaction to that. I think that's an excellent idea. Yeah. Um, uh, in Amsterdam, we have a, a, a large pro program just started, uh, which is called SimCity. Yeah. Um, and actually, I'm leading that. And that's that's a program where we want to actually simulate, you know, parts of the city, and we just start with traffic because you know that's pretty well understood, um, even though it's complex. Um, and there's a lot of data that we can actually tap into. Um, and we know a lot about social behavior that goes with that. So it, it actually is a very good starting point from which you can develop uh, ideas about uh, the influence of certain policies. And, and, and Singapore is pretty unique because you can really get data up to minutes of the 24,000 taxis that are drive, driving around. Yeah. And you can get this kind of uh, things that, uh, 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 that was just mentioned, that about the uh, behavioral aspects of, of, of policies that you implement. So I think it's an excellent idea. Okay. Not only that... I think we have a problem now. Well, he's, I, he's I just, let me just add to... to no, but he, he's yeah, making yeah. a problem. He's saying, stop. <laughs> <laughs> and no, now uh, he's saying, let him talk. So yes. my leadership, you're, you're disputing my leadership here. <laughs> well, you're both oh, Jan, okay. so it is a Jan uh, who is saying that uh, we should do this. Uh, the other thing about Singapore is we have a history since 1975 or so, which is a long time in terms of the car population, the congestion uh, status, the income levels, the population mix, all kinds of data over 40 years or so of all the different attempts to control the car population and to control the transportation system, including the public transport build-up. So that is a, is a rich uh, treasure trove of data that I think can be used to discover some uh, inherent uh, yeah. relationships. I think that there's no, uh, plenty of fine. room there. Yeah. Okay, but na yeah, b b exactly. That's what you caused. You did it. It's not my fault. You did it, please. So if, if I can just one point about it, I think this, this is an excellent example where Singapore could use existing complexity ideas to uh, improve public policy in, 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 the, in, the, in this local environment. Now, a different and more complicated, a harder question is, is there a domain which so far the rest of the world has not adopted where complexity tools could, in fact, be useful, which Singapore would have some comparative advantage in? Now, I have a recent paper where I say, there are three and a half successes of, agent of, of, pol of complexity tools in the public s policy sector, as Rolanda, Rolanda said, uh, traffic, combat, and, um, and epidemiology. But I think that there's, there's emerging idea, though, that within finance, you could also do a lot. And this is where Singapore maybe also has comparative it's advantage, yeah. but no one has really done much yet with, with, with finance. Okay, finance, another one. Okay. Peter, and then we are st okay. stopping. Yeah, I right. think we are doing it. Yeah. Uh, just one comment, because I think these types of quick wins where you can transport is a really good idea. The other thing is that when you're a practitioner, you learn to listen to what is your customer saying. We have the ambassador here telling us, this is what I need. So let's start that dialogue. She said, I need to know how we transition the democracy from what we have to normal democracy. I don't have the answer for it, but I think what we should say is to say, how do we get in a dialogue to say, these are the six challenges, can we contribute? And she actually told us. And it's what we would call a buying signal in the commercial. You're suggesting find a way to contribute to well, she from complexity to in organizing and facilitating she the dialogue. put it more eloquent than I can ever okay. do, but she said one thing. She said, we need to transition from what we have to what she called the normal democracy. Yeah. That is perhaps a challenge that could be unique for Singapore, and it could mean a lot for the understanding of participation 
in right. other parts of the world. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, go ahead. I think that's what's interesting that you have to provide a kind of contained safe space for that to happen okay, and play yeah. around with those things. That yeah. is okay, okay. Good. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So here's a different perspective. A lot of the examples that we've seen over the last two days show that, uh, there are, that, that part of complexity are self-organizing systems. And I think there's a, an incredible degree of um, scientific hubris in this room if we fail to recognize that societies are self-organizing. So let's not look just at the problem space, let's look at the solution space. And what are the examples within Singapore or elsewhere, where we have had self-organization, just like we have the, these other areas of self-organization. And I, I'll throw this out, but this might not be it. But if you've seen interracial marriages increase, what's that been a complexity solution to? And how would you reconstruct the problem from the solution? And that, what would that tell you? OK, thank, thank you very much. That's an interesting one. Yeah, no. I think, I think, yeah, that's a, it's a little bit of pity. Yeah? Now the music is coming. Eh? That's <laughs> and, uh, so, no, we have got to stop now because uh, that, that the next step is, has been done in the, in the, it will be start now, isn't it? Yeah. Okay, then we stop. Thank you very much for your contribution. And what you have, bring it to you. <laughs>